Okay, so here's the next video on defense against infectious disease, and obviously, it looks like I misspelled defense, but that's the way that IB spells it. It's the European way to spell defense. Um, so let me go ahead and get started here, and maybe I can go ahead and get started with uh, talking a little bit about defining a pathogen. And there's a long definition we talked about in class, but essentially what you need to know is that a pathogen is an organism or virus that causes disease causes a disease um, notice that I, viruses are not organisms so viruses are not alive which we'll come back to in just a moment um, and when we talk about an organism that causes a disease usually we're talking about bacteria um, but it could be other things like certain kinds of fungi or something like that. But we usually we're talking about bacteria and viruses, um, but viruses aren't alive. So we need to talk about um, the next thing that we need to do is talk a little bit about antibiotics. So anti means against and bio means life. So antibiotics essentially are chemicals um, that attack the metabolic pathways of, um, of a pathogen. Now, this is really interesting because if this works for bacteria, um, but not for viruses. And we'll talk about it in just a second why. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about bacteria. You, we should, we know that bacteria are prokaryotic cells, and I hope you remember that word from ninth grade. Um, they're prokaryotic cells, and humans, which we're all we're concerned about right now, in our health, um, are eukaryotic, which means eukaryotic means that there's a nucleus in the cell and all these other fancy organelles like endoplasm, reticulum, Golgi bodies, that kind of thing. Prokaryotic means that it lacks a nucleus. It also lacks a lot of other kinds of organelles. And that means that it's slightly, it's a little different than eukaryotic cells. So when we're infected by bacteria, we can take these chemicals that affect prokaryotic metabolic pathways or metabolism of prokaryotic cells um, without hurting ourselves. Viruses, on the other hand, have no, or sorry, let's say don't have their own metabolism. They're so small that in fact they don't have their own ribosomes, they can't make their own proteins or their own machinery, so they need a host. And in order to have not, and in order, well, we're, the hosts that we're talking about for our purposes right now are humans. So what the, what the viruses do is they inject their own genetic material into the hosts and in this case us into the hosts DNA and then when we so when we um, copy DNA we are unknowingly copying viral DNA um, or um, make proteins from that DNA we are helping the virus. So without knowing that we would be making lots and lots of copies, hundreds of copies of that virus and the viral proteins unknowingly, and then it would cause the cell to bust open, unleash those hundreds of viruses onto other cells in which it would repeat the process. So they don't have their own metabolism. So if we were to give, if we had to come up with some kind of molecule or uh, something that would attack viruses and especially in this way we find that we're actually killing ourselves and so that's why antibiotics work for bacteria but not viruses it has to do with their metabolism okay so um so we talked about uh these different oops i apologize um these different molecules i mean the different kinds of pathogens 
But one that we did not talk about, one mechanism that we didn't talk about yet, is skin and mucus. Thanks for mucus. OUS, okay. And mucus. So skin is the primary defense. Um, uh, it's a, a barrier, it's a physical barrier. Primary defense, all right. Physical barrier, so when there are pathogens in the environment, the skin is a good barrier to prevent them from getting in our bodies. Um, and in that actuality, we have, we have glands in our skin that secrete lactic acid and um, fatty acids. And what it does is makes our skin slightly acidic and so acidic and acidic enough that the bacteria won't be able to survive on our skin, especially the pathogenic bacteria, the ones that's not that are not good for us. Whereas the mucus, scroll down a little bit, whereas the mucus um, has a couple of other functions that's similar. So the mucus contains um, lysozyme enzymes, which are just enzymes that will break down the molecules of that pathogen. And secondly, um, the mucus can be sticky, think of snot, um, and trap the pathogens. And then your body gets rid of it by sneezing or coughing. Okay? So that's how that works. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so we're going to transition a little bit more. Um, once again, to how um, phagocytes ingest pathogens. Um, and so So what we know is that, um, let's say we had um, some bad cells in our in our bloodstream, we would we would have some phagocytes um, that are these big cells that would recognize these um, pathogens. And what these what would happen is as these pathogens get closer and closer, um, they they come to the the membrane of the phagocyte. The phagocyte recognizes them, and then this pathogen goes into the phagocyte through a process called endocytosis, finds its way inside the cell at a um, lysosome, an organelle inside, finds its way towards the lysosome, into the lysosome, and then the lysosome unleashes enzymes to break down the um, pathogen. So now these little tiny pieces are loose and they come towards the um, membrane and release the little tiny proteins that no longer affect the host. And that's really how a phagocyte works. Um, I hope that makes sense to you. And the way that this recognition occurs is that there are um, antibodies and antigens. And antigens are proteins or polysaccharides on a pathogen and when they're in our body um, especially the first time your body has to recognize them and make antibodies think of antibiotics um, that bond to and um, destroy antigens 
But once you have been exposed to an antigen, you create an antibody, and you're, if you're re-exposed to the exact same antigen, your body already has the antibodies floating around in its blood to attack it. If it's the first time, your body's got to recognize it, recover, and um, build antibodies to attack it. Okay? Um, okay, and the last thing we need to talk about is HIV. Um, and I hope you know something about HIV. HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. Um, HIV. So you need to know um, the causes of HIV. Um, so this virus needs a host and humans are the hosts in this case but more specifically T cells and the viruses again embed their genetic material into the T cells copy themselves when the T cells make copies of themselves and make proteins and then um, bust open the T cells so when you have lots of viruses they actually destroy T cells which lowers antibiotic production so this in, in the, the effect is that it, you have a weakened immune system making someone vulnerable to dying from things like the common cold. Because their immune system is so weak. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about um, HIV and AIDS, really. And AIDS is the condition in which someone ha someone has an extremely low. T cell count. So we need to know causes, transmission, and social implications. So let's talk a little bit about causes of AIDS. So one, HIV causes it. So if you have enough HIV in your body that's killing the T cells, you're going to have less T cells, and so that's what causes AIDS. Um, so HIV destroys antibody-making cells. So there are less of them over time, and the body becomes vulnerable, which is what causes AIDS. Now, um, HIV can be transmitted through vaginal or anal intercourse. Or even oral sex if um, if any cuts or tears are present even tiny ones that you can't see with with your naked eye um, also by sharing um, hypodermic uh, needles like for intravenous drugs um, through the placenta from mom to child because the virus is so small it fits through the barrier um, via cuts during childbirth
or through breast milk. Again, because the barrier is so small. It doesn't work out that well. Um, I'm going to add over this way. Through blood transfusions, although there are now tests that work to prevent this. And then, um, yeah, we'll leave it there. There are a couple others. We're not going to really talk too much about that. But essentially when blood is being shared or exchanged. So social implications. Um, one, there's grief from friends and relatives. When someone dies or develops AIDS, um, families can often get become poorer because if this condition um, impacts the breadwinner or one of the breadwinners, the family income can come down. Um, third, becomes difficult for an individual to find a partner. Um, sometimes employment or even housing. Um, so there are some social implications involved as well. So this is what you need to know and that takes care of um, the immune system. So you need to know the, the example of HIV and AIDS, okay?